Hi, um, welcome to this event on bridging the fossil fuel production gap for a just, sustainable and resilient recovery. Uh, I am Megan Darby, I'm the acting editor of Climate Home News and this is supposedly part of London Climate Action Week, this event, but we are, I don't think any of us are actually calling in from London, um, we are around the world. I'm actually in my childhood bedroom, although sadly Sadly, they've taken down the kitten posters by now. Um, so uh, the fossil fuel production gap report was published uh, last year um, really to draw attention to the discrepancy between the international goals we have to prevent dangerous climate change and the amount of coal, oil and gas that governments are collectively planning to extract, produce, sell. And um, the report found that um, out to 2030, the amount of fossil fuel production in the pipeline is, um, so to speak, is 50% more than is compatible with holding global warming to two degrees and 120% more than um, holding global warming to 1.5 degrees, the tougher limit in the Paris Agreement um, that is seen as essential to the survival of some smaller island states. Um, so this was a huge joint effort between the UN Environment Programme and um, some leading climate research institutes. Uh, this afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, today, we are going to be hearing from a couple of the report authors, uh, representatives from government, the UN and uh, in the investor community about um, what's stayed the same since then and also what's changed. Um, so there's work underway on a, a follow up uh, that looks at um, the coronavirus pandemic and the response to it in terms of the market response, um, the economic downturn and also the government response in terms of all the bailouts and um, recovery packages and what difference those make to the trajectory for fossil fuels. So we're going to hear from five speakers. Uh, they are going to each speak for about five minutes and um, you will have the chance, then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, you should see a little icon on your screen that just has a little speech bubble with a question mark in it. That is, um, that will bring up the Q&A and you can type in questions as we go. So as you hear things from the speakers and you think you want to know more about that, um, go ahead and ask questions. You can also upvote each other's questions. So if, if you see somebody else's question and you want to know the answer as well, then just um, hit the thumbs up button uh, and it will rise to the top. And then when it comes to the Q&A, session um, I will try and ask as many of those questions put as many of those questions to the panel as we have time for um, and make sure we, we cover a good range of questions um, and answer your burning issues. So um, first of all we are going to hear from Michael Lazarus from the Stockholm Environment Institute so, I mean, given all that's changed since that production gap came out, we've seen, um, you know, the economic slump, we've seen oil demand uh, nosedive, uh, we've seen, um, you know, an unprecedented OPEC deal for countries to cut their production. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, private companies are, um, are cutting their, their capital spending and their oil exploration plans as well. And um, so how much of that production gap report uh, still holds and, and how much has changed, Michael? Yeah, th thanks, uh, Megan, um, and good morning from Seattle. Um, yeah, so so much has obviously changed in, in all our lives, and and especially in the world of energy. And you know, we've seen oil prices crash like never before, going negative, and more importantly, it looks like they may never return in a sustained fashion to those high levels we've seen before. Thirty to fifty dollar oil may be this new normal, and it's not just hitting the bottom line of oil companies, it's, it's hitting countries and regions that rely on fossil fuel production for government revenue. And they're getting hit especially hard, places like Nigeria, Angola, uh, 
subnational regions like Alberta and North Dakota, they're forced to cut spending, jobs, and social benefits. So the overall, the production and consumption of fossil fuels is obviously down steeply and likely something like 2% for gas, 10% for oil and coal this year. And while global emissions as a result may be down 8% this year without sustained efforts on for a sustainable recovery, they could easily rebound uh, strongly. So we're working on this, as you mentioned, Megan, the second production gap report this year to take stock of what these changes uh, and, and other changes could mean for a just transition from fossil fuels, which is at the core of, of this report. And so what we're finding is that the key messages from the first report indeed are all too relevant. So a quick recap for those who um, are new to the production gap report, you see a chart up here that features one of the, the headline findings. Um, you know, last year, a, a group of institutions, uh, including uh, Aveda's uh, institution, IISD, ODI, um, and others work with UNEP. And we found that um, this discrepancy between countries' planned fossil fuel and projected fossil fuel production and global climate goals was indeed large, as you mentioned, uh, Megan, that the governments are aiming, as this chart shows, uh, the difference between that red line, uh, the country's plans and projections, and production consistent with 1.5 and 2 degrees, 50% uh, uh, more fossil fuels by 2030 than would be consistent with 2 degrees, double what would be consistent with 1.5. And it showed that not only is there this stark disconnect uh, between uh, countries' plans, there's also a disconnect with countries' climate goals, which are expressed in that gold line that you, you see right there. So this year's report, we're going to look again, and what we expect to find is a similar disconnect, uh, but this time more around what countries are doing to support their uh, incumbent fossil fuel industries and what's needed to build back better. Uh, we've looked at the plans and projections again of major producers, and while much is on hold, obviously, because of COVID, there's yet to be any sign of a reset in most countries. If anything, a continuation of that path. You know, last year, subsidies to fossil fuel producers went up about 40% to about $50 billion globally. And while it's still early in this COVID stimulus phase, we don't know exactly where the funding is gonna go. And there's lots of opportunities now to put in the right direction. Much bigger purse is open, but they're warning signs. And I, that is going to speak to the work they're doing with this energy policy tracker in just a moment. It does seem that the fossil fuel sector and funding for it is greatly outpacing that for clean energy. And that risks that lock in of a high development path, high carbon development pathway um, that is sort of the opposite of building back better. So this moment right now presents us with a critical opportunity to turn this around. You know, clean energy paths are around the world proving themselves to be more resilient, less costly, uh, more dynamic engines of jobs, prosperity, and well-being. Uh, and the pandemic has also laid bare the social costs and financial risks of heavy reliance on this vulnerable industry with an uncertain future. You know, it's understandable that countries are looking at all industries to secure jobs and strengthen their economies and but the risk of supporting fossil fuel production are particularly acute uh, with this risk of stranded assets and social and environmental liabilities for decades to come. So that's why this year's production gap report is also going to feature a special chapter that explores how this transition can be managed in a way that minimizes disruption and ensures just and equitable outcomes. And it's also going to touch on the fact that several countries and other actors uh, including in the financial community, are showing real leadership with comprehensive climate energy strategies that cut fossil fuel subsidies, that limit new exploration and extraction, and chart a path to this diversified, sustainable economy that we need to see. Um, hopefully, Andrea's made it on from Costa Rica. They're among the first. We're seeing great action from Spain and Ireland and elsewhere. Um, glad to speak to that more. Mindful of time here. I want to hear from others here. But that's just a brief window into what this year's production gap report will touch on. Thanks, Megan.
Megan, you're muted. Try again. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, Michael, um, yeah, thank you for that roundup, and you, you've, you've reminded us of the, the second part of the uh, the headline. Um, so the, the first part is uh, we're producing far too much um, coal, oil, and gas, so far more than they can be safely burned. Um, and the second part is is about the just transition, and the it's not going to be easy for. Uh, countries um, and communities that are dependent economically on extracting fossil fuels um, to diversify, to find other sources of livelihoods. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's the kind of political obstacle that um, a lot of countries face. Um, so should we go next to Niklas Hegelberg from UN Environment Programme to talk a bit more about um, what kind of engagement you have have with governments on you know how they can um, manage that transition away from fossil fuels uh, in in a kind of sustainable and um, fair way over to you Niklas thank you Megan uh, the good news is that there's actually quite a number of things that governments can do to, to uh, transition away from fossil fuels so I would say the first one uh, are the the kind of plans that countries have put in place under the climate change convention so a nationally determined contributions that's one place where uh, transition away from these can be brought in and another key document are the long-term strategies where we look at then the the full decarbonization and and aiming more for that 2050 direction so those are clear market signals policy signals that countries can send uh to to kind of to demonstrate where we need to go uh these same documents whether it's one of these national determined contributions or even a sectoral uh, plan can be used as the blueprints for any covid uh, recovery investment so those plans exist right now and there's 80 of them uh, of these nationally determined contributions that actually talk about fiscal policies and what are needed to, to uh, move those uh, NDCs forward. So, so the NDCs, the long-term strategies, and then to use this as the blueprints in, in, um, uh, in the invest COVID recovery investment. Uh, we have noticed during COVID that emissions don't cut down that easily. So we're around that uh, 8-10% uh, mark in terms of emission reductions for 2020. So there's a much bigger systematic uh, kind of system-wide thing that we need to focus on. So governments need to support the, the system change. This is not just uh, about people flying a little bit less. Uh, it's also about the whole system that uh, that delivers our food, produces our food, uh, and uh, how houses are heated, cooled, and so forth. So governments need to focus on the system. That's something that is more difficult for an individual or a private sector to focus on. Then um, uh, I want to also raise a point on, on the just transition. Uh, there are many, many people working in the fossil fuel sector. So to make the transition away from fossil fuels as smooth as possible, we have to pay attention to ensure that there are proper livelihoods and that we focus on those geographical areas that are heavily dependent on uh, fossil fuels. So take India. with a million uh, we definitely have plenty of job opportunities that we can tap into and then um, finally uh, I want to go to the big elephant in the room and look at uh, fossil fuel subsidies uh, uh, fossil fuel subsidies are a key drain on uh, government uh, public resources so by focusing on kind of removing these these uh, unnecessary fossil fuel uh, subsidies, A, there can be more resources to invest into the decarbonization itself, but also into health related issues now under the COVID-19 uh, situation. And, and then perhaps the, the final part, uh, there is still an increasing amount of private sector 
sector investments going into fossil fuels ever since the Paris Agreement was uh, was uh, agreed upon. So we need to bring more transparency and uh, uh, and focus on the continuous investments in in this. But I, I believe that uh, that uh, some of my uh, fellows on the the panelists will also go into that. Back to you, Maker. And you're on mute again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is that muted? Um, right. Um, so we are trying to get um, Andrea Metzer from the Costa Rican Environment and Energy Ministry uh, on the call. Uh, but there have been some technical hitches. So I'm not sure. Is she? She no, she's not okay. Um, so we're going to skip to the next speaker, Adam Matthews, and it does follow on from what Nicholas was saying about private investment, because Adam um, represents the Transitions Pathway Initiative, and can give a perspective on um, the investment community and um, Adam, sort of what can investors do um, to promote the transition away from fossil fuels and how much does the investment community really get the issues around climate change and you know how much is that entering the mainstream that they need to be factoring that into their financial decisions hi well thank you for inviting me um i mean my day job is as director of ethics and engagement for a pension fund the church of england pensions board where we're a three billion pound pension fund serving so forty thousand beneficiaries who have to have a pension um, and be able to retire into a world that's not impacted by the extremes of climate change and we work collaboratively with many other investors pension funds um, across the world um, as asset owners and also with fund managers through key initiatives to really sort of play our role in supporting the transition. So um, in, in terms of what the investment community is doing, we've got the largest mobilisation of investors that's ever occurred internationally at every part of the world coming together in the Climate Action 100 initiative, focusing on the 160 systemic um, and major emitting companies across multiple sectors. $43 trillion of assets have come together in that initiative. And we, each company ranging from oil and gas companies, mining companies, steel companies, et cetera, have dedicated investors um, that lead on engaging with them to put in place clear targets aligned to the goals of the Paris Agreement. We want to see net zero targets. We want to see incentives within the company supporting that. And we want to see very clear, credible transition plans. And tools like the Transition Pathway Initiative, which I co-chair with the Environment Agency Pension Fund, um, have been created by investors to have an independent, academically robust way of being able to distinguish which companies are genuinely putting in place transition plans aligned to those goals and set in targets that can be verified and measured. Um, and that requires public disclosure from the companies and we engage with them to ensure that that's forthcoming and then we use tools like TPI to basically track that performance. And so you can go onto the TPI website, you can see in the oil and gas sector which companies now actually are putting targets in place that align to net zero um, and which aren't. And we've reached a sort of a key moment really where we've been engaging with companies I lead on engagement with Royal Dutch Shell. Um, I have colleagues that do the same with BP, others with Repsol, with Total, others with Exxon, etc. Um, and we coordinate very much amongst ourselves. But we've reached this point where for the first time you've got a critical mass of oil and gas companies um, all in Europe that have actually come together, have made commitments and targets to different degrees of ambition um, and are actually engaging with the concept of net zero. Now, let's be clear. Not all of those targets are equal. Not all of them are as ambitious as each other. And each of them have interpreted the concept of net zero probably in the most favorable way to their current business. But the point is, as a result of engagement with investors, their owners, you've seen a very significant shift amongst oil and gas companies in Europe and genuine strategies starting to emerge of transitioning the fundamental business model of those companies. Now, not all of those companies are going to manage this transition and some will continue to resist, as you see amongst some of the major uh, US oil and gas companies. But you are seeing strategies emerge um, following engagement with Climate Action 100 that's starting to put 
put in place some very radical shifts in the business models. Um, and obviously, at the same time, you've got now this huge impact of the COVID um, pandemic that is significantly reshaping demand for the oil and gas sector. And there could be two reactions to that. One is that you just carry on and try and sort of ride it out, or you can actually see this as a moment to actually drive a faster transition. And so far, you've seen some of the Europeans acknowledge that this is the moment they need to go further and faster, and investors are playing a role of encouraging that. But we're at a point, though, where actually there's only so many commitments an oil and gas company can make when actually those that buy the energy, their customers, need to be part of the solution. And so we now, as investors, are working through the value chain. So those that buy the energy of Shell, be it from aviation, shipping, road freight, road transport, et cetera, we are owners of those companies as well. And so we're looking at how we can, in effect, link up that whole value chain from the truck, the company that manufactures trucks to the people that buy the trucks to the companies that provide the energy into the system that supports trucks. Can you have net zero pathways through the value chain that therefore can ensure an oil and gas company provides energy into it and they know that it's into a net zero pathway that is appropriately independently verified as consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And we as owners of companies through that value chain have a unique role to play to bring it together to try and establish those pathways. And so investors are very actively engaging with individual companies and now we're starting to bring together those those chains through um, through the customer side so I think we're at an interesting moment I think there's a huge amount that still needs to be done investors are absolutely at table but we're also absolutely clear we need the regulation you can't just expect companies to act in absence of regulation and to, to think that finance will solve this by itself is a nonsense and you need to have that government part of the deal followed through. So we need to see the next COP with full commitments coming through from governments meeting their ambitions to put the regulatory structures in to enable companies to go further and faster and for pension funds such as ourselves to play our role and equally be committed to net zero in the way that we invest, be that in companies, be that in sovereign bonds of governments or be that in creating incentives in other ways. All right. Um, thank you, Adam. And um, I, I noticed there was a, quite a strong emphasis on European oil companies there. We haven't seen uh, nearly so much embracing of this issue from North America, um, but perhaps we can come back to that in the questions. Um, uh, just to remind you viewers that uh, the question box q a box is open you don't have to wait until the q a session you can ask your questions now and upvote each other's questions um, you can put your name and affiliation if you like you don't have to um, and if you would like um, to address your question to a particular member of the panel then please specify that um, so uh, still i think we still have some technical issues with andrea so um, i'm not sure if we can hear from her, but um, let's go on now to Iveta Girazimchuk uh, from IISD, who is going to give us some of those preliminary findings on, um, on the COVID recovery and um, how much that is uh, throwing a lifeline to fossil fuels. Um, Iveta, what, uh, what are your biggest worries based on the data you've gathered and are there any particularly um, concerning examples uh, where the where sort of government recovery money is being ejected into some going backwards to fossil fuels rather than um, forward to clean energy? Uh, thank you, Megan, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for uh, recovery packages, uh, we are a consortium of 14 organizations who have come together to um, uh, look at case-by-case uh, -case basis, uh, bottom-up, what countries are doing. Uh, so we will be launching a website um, where you can find all this data on the 15th of uh, uh, July. It's going to be energypolicytracker.org. Uh, and uh, as of now, uh, numbers are changing every day. Um, uh, I would say 
still a lot is in the making. Uh, we are kind of confirming funding only when measures have been approved. Uh, and uh, still, I would say the majority of measures uh, hasn't been approved. Um, we still have to see what comes out of governments, but the proposals and the staggering amounts of money that are on the table are the most worrying thing because this is now uh, once in a generation opportunity to uh, use government uh, funding, government uh, uh, subsidies, or loans, uh, or state enterprise investments uh, to reshape our future. And uh, what we see right now is that uh, pretty much what uh, countries did before the COVID uh, crisis, they keep doing. So in this sense, the crisis we have at hand has just exacerbated uh, the trends that existed before, unfortunately, and there are no surprises here. So countries that have um, um, looked more at uh, um, uh, reducing their emissions, um, try to impose conditions uh, on fossil fuel bailouts or invest more in green uh, recovery. Uh, countries that uh, have uh, already put a lot of subsidies um, into fossil fuels uh, are still bailing out um, fossil fuels. Uh, in this respect, um, the overall trend is that uh, both on the consumption and production side of uh, fossil fuels, uh, there is uh, more money going into um, uh, fossil fuels than into uh, clean energy. Uh, so uh, in terms of trends, uh, some of them are already quite uh, evident. Um, the first one I mentioned is that uh, there are attempts by some governments now to impose conditionality and uh, hopefully there will be more of that uh, in terms of uh, reducing emissions uh, or just uh, providing uh, money uh, uh, to fossil fuel uh, projects to clean up the mess that they have created like uh, Canada is uh, one of the examples where the federal government provided uh, funding for the cleanup of toxic uh, pollution uh, and uh, orphan wells, uh, as well as uh, for regulating methane leakages. We have to be very clear that this is still money going to the fossil fuel industry, and this is still violating the polluter pays principle. So in a perfectly um, uh, kind of organized system, it, it's the polluter that has uh, uh, to pay those costs. Uh, here it's uh, the government that's picking up the bill. But it's it's still a step in the right um, direction. And then in terms of um, a green recovery, uh, there are also different shades of green. So it can be a, a emerald green, it can be a jade green, bottle green, khaki, whatever. Um, uh, there are a lot of shades. Um, uh, oh. There are also, especially on the production side, um, now discussions about hydrogen, uh, which is uh, one of the new trends. Uh, so again, hydrogen produced from fossil fuels, and this is an agenda very much supported by some companies. Um, the so-called blue hydrogen is, is, is still uh, uh, fossil fuel extraction. So uh, in this sense, um, uh, it's, uh, it's not a game changer. Uh, but if it comes with CCS, it has less uh, emissions. And then uh, like truly green hydrogen, which comes from renewables, like is again a new phenomenon. Uh, but it's uh, um, uh, in both cases uh, still a question of how uh, safeguards are uh, um, uh, put in place and um, how the conditionality in both uh, fossil fuel uh, support and um, clean energy support is implemented uh, because we have we've seen, for instance, um, uh, support going to electric cars, which is great. Uh, but again, like it depends where electricity is coming from. So uh, I think there are a lot of those different shades and uh, we just need full transparency. And um, uh, if it's public money, governments should be uh, accountable for how uh, they are spending it. So overall, uh, 
as I said, uh, there is still uh, a lot of uh, things in the making. So we have an opportunity now to influence uh, the uh, recovery uh, and um, use uh, this uh, large amounts of public money uh, for uh, reinventing our future. Over to you. OK, thank you, Iveta. So many shades of green in the recovery. Um, and uh, I wonder what shade you would describe Costa Rica as. Uh, Costa Rica is often described as one of the greenest countries in the world. Uh, you have very clean electricity. Um, you have reversed uh, deforestation and made good progress there. Um, but the cars on your street still but mostly burn petrol and diesel, right? Um, and um, but you, you, what people may not know about Costa Rica is that you have a moratorium on oil and gas exploration. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk a bit about um, what uh, the thinking was behind that for Costa Rica and um, you know was there any t tension with uh, your development goals um, you know a lot of countries see oil and gas as, as a way to make money and lift people out of poverty um, so um, t t tell me about um, about Costa Rica's uh, take on all this. Thank you, and, and I really apologize because I was having these technical problems, but I'm glad that I made it at the last moment. So um, good morning and, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, the first um, thing that I will say is that right now we really want to consolidate this moratorium. This is done by decree. When we launch our decarbonization plan, we launch this decree to establish the moratorium. But one thing that we are now doing is to promote a law so this moratorium can be enhanced in a more uh, stronger manner one way or the other. So it's something, it's a big discussion that we're having right now. And of course, in this uh, pandemic time, we are hearing a lot of voices and a lot of pushback to try to, you know, uh, say that we should uh, one way or the other, use our resources in oil and gas to pay our transition to decarbonization. This is a little bit what some forcers are saying. I know it sounds very not, not really logic, but this is the kind of arguments that we are hearing right now, even in a country like Costa Rica, as you were saying, which has this uh, green tradition, but it is, that's why I would say it's, it's like uh, risky times right now for all these policies. And it's very important for us to demonstrate that we can generate green jobs and blue jobs as well, that, uh, that it is critical at the same time when we are having these conversations with multilaterals, with FMI, to really come with these uh, structural packages of policies that can really implement this pathway to decarbonization and to resilience. And we are doing that. The, the current government is very committed to this agenda. And in the conversations that we are having, we are using our decarbonization plan to prioritize which are the kind of investments that we want to use in this recovery stage. For example, we are saying one of the big um, investments that we would like to move right now is the electric train. As you were saying, transport is, is our nightmare right now. But we know that if we invest in this train, in this electric train, this can be changing the way our cities are right now and transform them into a more sustainable mobility pathway. And in the other hand, we also need to have a balance between the urban zones and the rural areas. And we are also picking uh, precision agriculture as one of also of the priorities that we have in this recovery plan right now that we are seeing and that we are proposing. And it's the kind of narrative and elements that we are uh, discussing, having a lot of interaction right now with the Ministry of Planning, with the Ministry of Finance. One interesting element is that, for example, we are in conversations with IMF and IMF is having conversations with, with us, with the Ministry of, of Environment, which I think it's a very good signal to also see if there are some conditionalities that should be included uh, in these uh, support packages that we are discussing right now. 
The other element was also kind of uh, policy-based loans that we have been moving with IDB, with World Bank, and these uh, policy-based loans were based on the decarbonization plan. So this, this reflection that at the end it is possible to use our long-term strategy to mobilize resources for, for one element. And these resources, for example, on, on, the, uh, on these PBLs, they were used in the response stage and they were very useful. And the Ministry of Finance was very happy that we were allowed to use that money to the response phase. And now that we are talking about the recovery phase, uh, that we have the long-term strategy, the decarbonization plan, and that we can prioritize which are the areas that will help us to generate green and blue uh, jobs and uh, starting this recovery stage. But uh, it is something that we are all the time having a pushback from different sectors and that it is critical that we can deliver soon <laughs> that it is possible to generate this green and blue economy. So this is a little bit the, the reflection that I would like to bring and that multilaterals and IMF can really play, I would say, a, a very important role right now uh, because these will, if they come with some, uh, um, with some conditionalities, uh, this will um, really help this transition and, and do this alignment in the whole policy uh, structure that we have. So I will leave my reflections here, Megan, and back to you. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Yes, that's really interesting to hear from you that even in a country like Costa Rica, you face these lobbying pressures um, and it, it's uh, not always easy to um, to uh, defend and, and uh, promote um, that kind of greener approach. Uh, so we've got a few questions in and, and keep your questions coming in. We'll answer as many as we can um, over the next uh, half an hour till the end of the event. Um, so uh, we've got a few related questions. Um, let me just uh, have a little skim. OK. So we've got a couple of questions about Africa. Uh, Zach asks, um, I'm, I'll, I'll ask both these questions and then it may be something that more than one speaker wants to address. Uh, Zach asks, how do you see developing regions like sub-Saharan Africa achieve a just transition to renewable energy when 600 million have no access to electricity and there's large reliance on coal and fossil fuels? Um, so um, I've got another question about Africa. Uh, maybe Nicholas, um, you'd like to speak to this? Um, from the UN Environment Programme perspective. Um, and Simon Anderson from IIED asks, um, on a related note, where are the fossil fuel dependent developing countries of Africa and elsewhere going to get the fiscal firepower necessary to launch just transitions for sustainable development, like widespread enabling of electricity access? Um, Nicola, Nicholas, do you want to have a, a shot at these those questions? I uh, found Zach's question, so I'll, I'll have to look for the other one still, but uh, let's start with Zach's question there. So uh, indeed, if you have 600 million people still without access to electricity, it is something that you need to pay attention to. It's one of the sustainable development goals, access to energy, so obviously it's a big uh, question. The answer obviously is also quite complex. Um, it's not just like that to pull electricity uh, line uh, grid lines uh, across vast areas. So there are other solutions actually that probably can deliver cheaper solutions than uh, going for the traditional concentrated energy production and then drawing transmission lines. Uh, in Kenya here where I'm uh, living, uh, there is a one company alone that uh, that uh, installs 600 households a day with uh, with this kind of small scale solar solution. So for a very small amount, you can get a refrigerator, a TV, a couple of chargers, and then you have your household hooked up to to solar energy. Uh, I would say that these companies are at least in East Africa they are mushrooming, and I can see uh, I'm following them on, on social media and on almost a weekly basis do I see um, 
this kind of uh, uh, re uh, announcement of uh, vacancies. So they're recruiting with with really fast uh, fast uh, pace, and I think that frankly it will be almost difficult for the traditional energy and electricity production solutions to to financially compete with the solutions they are providing. And then, uh, sorry, I missed the who provided the other question, so I, I didn't see that one. Uh, yes, that's uh, Simon Anderson. He was asking um, where are the fossil fuel dependent developing countries of Africa and elsewhere going to get the fiscal firepower necessary to launch just transitions? Yes, um, I, I think and uh, again, I'm going to use an example from from Kenya uh, where there has been a coal uh, plant in the making for quite some years. Uh, if a country looking to to find investments into its energy system. Obviously, it's going to be looking at all the solutions that are there, but if there aren't just the, the investors that are ready to invest into the renewables, then they're going to be leaning towards the coal side of things. And uh, I think that here in Kenya, we have now kind of shifted away from the coal energy uh, discussion, but there's still a major need for investment in, in the other solutions, so into wind and, and solar and, and hydro and so forth. Back to you, Megan. OK, and um, thank you. And um, Leo Roberts from E3G asks about the equity aspect of fossil fuel production. I think I'll, maybe I'll throw this one to Andrea. He says um, every country with fossil fuel reserves sees themselves as the country that will get to extract the last drop. Um, but although in principle Mozambique, for example, and Mozambique is um, is looking to develop big uh, uh, natural gas reserves. Um, although in principle Mozambique has more objective right to produce oil than the US, the moral principle won't neatly translate into political reality. Uh, and then sort of related institutional question, um, can the UNFCCC, the UN climate body, um, realistically ever be the venue for such a discussion, given its aversion to the phrase fossil fuels? Um, and yes, I have to say U UN climate change, it's very much oriented around the emissions side of the equation um, and they don't really have any um, space for talking about the fossil fuel side. So there's two questions there, but maybe I'll, I'll just um, let's start with the first one to you, Andrea, um, that, you know, do should developing countries be um, given the space to uh, profit from oil and gas as, have, as more developed countries have? Or is that just kind of a dead end and it makes more sense to just go straight to renewables if you can? Thank you. And, and, and this discussion of equity, it's, it's a big political and sensitive ones, of course. And, and what I will say is that we all the time we're taking decisions on what is our development path and and which is the kind of development that we want and and of course we we need to really consider are these elements and really have a big discussion on which is the kind of activities economic activities that can generate more jobs but at the same time can generate more welfare and can generate more health and, and normally when you put all these elements together, you realize that it's not fossil fuels industry. The right now you can generate more jobs with renewables. The right now you can generate more jobs with nature-based solutions schemes. And there are a lot of, of elements that we need to consider. And as I was saying in Costa Rica, we do have gas and, and <laughs> and petrol here in, in the country. And, and it is a big discussion that we are having, but we are saying this is not the kind of development that we want because we have seen that we can generate more profit and more welfare with this green and blue model. And I guess that at the end, of course, every country need to identify which is the kind of model that they want. But I will say that it's very critical to have a balanced approach to this. What we are saying is we cannot have a healthy uh, model of the economy if we don't incorporate all these um, limits that we know that we need to address. I think that with COVID, what, 
what is clear is that if we don't pay attention to science, <laughs> then we will have a lot of impact <laughs> in with in the welfare of our communities and, and could be really a, a mess in the kind of development and responses. So it's it's a little bit what I can say at the end. Everyone will need to identify what's the right model, but we need to balance everything. And there are options, technological options, and there are ways to really have everything in this systemic approach. Thanks, Andrea. And um, I think I'm going to throw the second question to Michael, um, the second part of that question. Can the UNFCCC be the venue for this kind of discussion, uh, given its aversion to talking about fossil fuels? And I, um, I saw another one that's um, sort of related to the, the kind of political dynamics about around this um, that maybe you'd also like to address from Amir Sokolovsky. He says, uh, not only are developing and least developed countries at a disadvantage in transitioning um, from, uh, you know, in some cases more than half of their GDP, depending on the production of fossil fuels, uh, but these companies uh, or countries hold political sway, uh, creating political barriers to governance change. So where would the support to supplant this influence come from? So I think what our, Amir is asking is, um, is sort of how do you counter the oil lobby, uh, to put it more more bluntly. Um, so, uh, Michael, um, but the, the institutional question on, on climate change, uh, UN, UN climate negotiations, um, you know, are they the forum to discuss this? Um, and then then how do you counter um, industry lobbying? Great questions. I'll admit I'm not a political scientist, so I, I'm not going to give you a, a deep analysis of how to overcome incumbent interests. But Obviously, this conversation needs to change. Indeed, that's why we we issued the production gap report last year uh, and presented it at the last COP. Uh, and you see that conversation actually beginning to shift. Um, you see the, the the countries engaging on this question. And I, I I'm almost going to jump back to uh, one of the comments that was in the questions that referred back to um, how African countries respond. There's this great report from the UN uh, uh, University called Stranded Assets in Africa. Uh, and what it points out is that this conversation around stranded assets hasn't really happened yet in most of the world. Um, we need to start that conversation. This is one of the points that Fatima Denton and, and, and crew who developed this report are making, is that we need to start having these conversations around is, are fossil fuels a legitimate, valid, and sustainable a path to development. And what might have seemed true 10, 20 years ago may no longer seem true, even given all the problems countries have run into with that path of development. Now, back to the political question, I think the more we start having those conversations uh, in the margins, the more countries come forward with this. Is ultimately the, um, the UNFCC the place where we can talk about phase down of fossil fuels? Um, it, it, taxes the existing infrastructure that is based on emissions, understandably. But long-term strategies, that's part of the next phase of what countries are doing. NDCs, as Nicholas pointed out, they are perfect tools for talking about how you are going to phase down the demand for fossil fuels and reducing emissions at the same time phasing down the supply. Because if we don't do the same, there is an imbalance that perpetuates those very political interests that get in the way of progress. OK, thank you. And um, I gather Adam wants to speak to the lobbying question. I also noticed a question about um, investor, an investor specific question um, that I'll throw to Adam. Let me just find it. Um, uh, but OK, Adam, Adam um, talk about how, how to counter lobbying first and, and then I'll find the other question and throw it to you. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we've been as, as investors looking at the way that companies that are committing to the goals of the Paris Agreement are then um, translating that through the resourcing of industry associations in many countries. 
um, and the influence those industry associations then have on the political um, decision making processes. And investors are very clear now that if you are committing to the goals of the Paris Agreement, which we are clearly asking them to do, that they need to ensure that they're not only lobbying as an individual company in that way, but they're ensuring that their industry associations are also lobbying in a consistent way with that. And there is an enormous amount of inconsistency in that regard where you often see um, a lot of industry bodies having huge influence and doing something completely opposite to what some of their member companies say that they support. So investors are, are requiring evidence of good governance um, from companies of their resourcing, their use of their shareholders' resources, of their lobbying activities. And you've started to see some significant shifts. Just in the last year, we've seen 12 companies in Europe make commitments, and that's their lobbying infrastructure throughout the world and ensuring that there's a consistency in that. Um, and at the moment, we are, the Judge of England, along with the Swedish Pension Fund, AP7, and, and the French fund manager, BNP Paribas, we're consulting on what a good lobbying standard should be for industry, because we think it's time to define what good is and that you can actually start to have positive lobbying where you're actively working to really change the policy structure to support net zero pathways. And there there's the potential alignment where you can see investors working with companies to see the regulatory shift that's needed um, to support that in sort of key sectors and key technology rollout, etc. So we think it's a hugely important role. We're asking for companies to look at their complete lobbying footprint and we're, we're looking to have transparency from them on how they're ensuring that that is consistent with their commitments to the net uh, to, to Paris, etc. So I think there's a very important continuous role in that. Thanks, Adam. And um, just uh, coming back to, I, I found the question. It was from Jacques Vogeli. Uh, he was one of the first to ask a question, put a question in the uh, box. With the increase in cost of capital and debt, as well as the realization of st stranded assets especially within developing countries in the oil and gas sector. How are investors bridging the socio-economic gap being formed by the withdrawal of these fossil developments across developing economies? Um, I, I mean, I, is, is that... Mm. At the moment, look, we, we as a fund um, want to, those companies that are public companies, the major ones, only an element of of the um, of, of the producers of oil and gas. Um, most of them, most oil and gas is coming from non-state, um, from state-owned companies, and we need to acknowledge that. What's our hook on them and their transition paths and the way they can do it? Um, well, actually, we're, we're also owner of sovereign bonds, and through that, we have an avenue that investors have yet to fully explore in terms of actually trying to ensure that those companies that states have significant ownership of are actually starting to support the transition as well. And this is something that we're looking to develop um, a framework on that's comparable to the one we currently have of companies. Now, how do you ensure that countries um, themselves can sort of jump the oil and gas aspect. Um, we obviously support that. We think the role of the international process is critical to it. We also want to invest in all the alternative um, low carbon transition technologies, all the low carbon alternatives. We, as an investor, we want to do that. The challenge for us is it's about managing the risk of doing it. And at the moment, you don't have a sufficiently focused set of international institutions in the finance sector that is bridging the gap in in risk to enable us to be able to put our pension funds money into it in a meaningful way. There's been some good pilots. We know there's some work that's been done with the World Bank, etc. But it's not at a scale at the moment that you could see major pension funds on a coordinated basis really resourcing developing countries in a way that can help mitigate the risk that there is in doing that that we currently have. And I think if we could repurpose some of these institutions to really work proactively with investors, then that could be one of the most helpful ways to be able to support and address the point that you're raising. And I think that's where we would love to be able to be generating returns from supporting countries' transitions. We do it through private um, investments, through private equity, but it's not at the scale at the moment that's needed. Um, and I think there's huge potential potential for that to be grown and the multilateral institutions and, and the banks have, have a huge role to play um, in that space. Thank you um, and there are a couple of um, quite 
general questions in the chats that I, I'm not sure who's best to direct them to. So I'm just going to read them and you wave at me if you're interested in answering them. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll try and throw it to who's ever, whoever's interested. Um, but um, one uh, this is anonymous uh, person, but um, could the panelists talk more about the polluter pays principle from a moral perspective? Is the polluter the producer or the ultimate consumer? Um, and how do you allocate responsibility between the, th the two? So, of course, the, um, and the UN climate change um, operates on the basis of emissions and accountability for emissions, which is um, generally the, the sort of consumption end. Um, but then the, the, this production gap is all about how um, the producers also have some kind of responsibility for managing their impact on climate change and we're seeing that oil companies are you know in some places are starting to grasp that um does anyone okay uh, adam's raising his hand let's go to you adam yeah i mean um it's absolutely clear that the responsibility flows throughout um and and it's and it's not possible to sort of hide from the responsibility if you're an oil and gas company producing um, products that result in emissions and if 85 percent of that is from people using purchasing your product and burning it um, you have a direct responsibility with that and you need to have a strategy that addresses it now some of the solutions you may have may not be directly in your control and are about reshaping the demand side drivers of those that come to you as customers but you also have a powerful tool in that you can choose not to sell your energy to those that do not have clear strategies to mitigate their emissions in line with net zero pathways and Shell have put that concept on the table. Now, we're at the early stages of understanding that. We need to quantify it and we need an independent way of being able to work out how that can work. But in theory, you could see companies refusing to sell energy to people that are normally their customers in shipping, in aviation, in trucking, for example, unless they are mitigating those emissions. And I think this is where partnerships are going to play a really important role to be able to find those pathways and actually those mitigations. And that way you can ensure that the responsibility is acknowledged and spread and addressed. And I think that's again something investors are keen to play a very active role because we own the companies through the value chains. Thank you, Adam. And um, a kind of related question, um, again, uh, anonymous, but do we need a multilateral legal framework to manage the transition away from fossil fuels fairly? Um, so, for example, could we have a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty in the same way uh, that we have non-proliferation? non-proliferation treaty um, for, for nuclear weapons. Um, so again, that's, that's sort of looking at the, the kind of institutional, best institutional way of managing this. Um, I don't know if Andrea would like to speak to this. Um, <laughs> picking on you, Andrea, <laughs> any thoughts? Um, I think that we have the Paris Agreement and it's a very strong instrument that we have. And, and, and of course, uh, what I think is that we need to start working in, in different areas, in these economic areas with consumers. I mean, at the end is to really generate a movement that is aligned with these elements. I strongly believe in multilateralism and my country strongly believes in multilateralism. It is the way. But I think that we already have <laughs> one uh, good uh, accord, which is the Paris Agreement. And right now what we need is to start working in climate action and implementation, and we need to move fast and we need to align the different uh, funds. <laughs> we need to, um, to greener the financial system. We need to work closely with the developing community, with the consumers, with the producers, with this value change approach. I totally agree. So I think that at the end is I will not spend more time in the negotiation of a new treaty. <laughs> I will try to invest that energy right now in climate action. Yeah, fair enough. It's um, UN, the UN um, Paris Agreement may not be um, perfect 
in uh, addressing the supply sides of the equation. But um, yeah, who really wants to spend more time in negotiating rooms? Um, so uh, the next question, um, Graham Atkins asks, um, the SEI report on supply side measures suggests various supply side policy options for reducing the production of fossil fuels. What, if any, are the potential impacts of COVID-19 on the application of these kinds of policies and the likelihood of success? Does the pandemic favour any of the types of policies or actions described? Um, are quantity based instruments more likely due to the fall in oil price, for example? Um, that doesn't, I, I, I don't know what a quantity based instrument is. So perhaps, if, if Eta, you could break that down for simpletons like me, um, uh, but I'm sure you, you understand the question. Uh, go, go ahead, Iveta. Sure. Uh, I think what's meant here is quotas for production and uh, production cuts ultimately. So, and we have seen it in a most um, uh, strange way, like a few months after the publication of the production gap report um, uh, with uh, the uh, OPEC uh, and OPEC plus discussions, then spilling over to the G20 energy ministers. So it all became about uh, production cuts. Uh, and uh, it, it's, um, of course, not coming from any climate perspective. It still has uh, impact on emissions because as a result of, uh, they, they cut about uh, 10 uh, um, uh, million barrels, billion bo barrels per day. So, uh, I mean, it's, it still has, uh, of course, uh, impacts on the baseline for emissions uh, and uh, it's uh, totally not uh, uh, kind of uh, a small decision by governments to implement it. So um, I think that's going to happen more uh, in the future and also within some countries it can happen. We saw even the Texas uh, Railroad um, Commission uh, discussing uh, like some initiatives to manage uh, production in Texas and the United States. So uh, I think that's that's bound to happen. And um, uh, there are also uh, other instruments that we discussed in the uh, production gap report, such as taxation, increased taxation uh, on fossil fuel production. That's also going to happen because ultimately countries are going to need money. So right now we've seen a lot of um, uh, tax breaks uh, and tax deferrals for uh, all producing companies. But uh, after response and recovery, we're going to have austerity uh, and, and uh, there will be more taxation of uh, fossil fuel production as well. Uh, and some other um, things uh, which uh, we mentioned in the report, such as um, uh, also trade related measures um, uh, can, can take place. Uh, or, or, and, or, and just bans and moratoriums uh, are still on the table. I mean, right now we seen, we're we seeing the uh, move in the other uh, direction, uh, but ultimately um, uh, the economics will, uh, I guess, uh, also influence um, uh, uh, the way the companies and governments uh, view viability of uh, a lot of projects and uh, a lot of them are going to be as well um, delayed and at some point subsidies to them will not become economically sustainable anymore. Thanks Yvette. Um and I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, there's some quite uh, detailed questions here. You're clearly an expert audience, um, but uh, if there are any last minute questions, do um, ping them up. Um, so I've got another one from Simon Anderson, um, which I'm going to send across to Michael. Um, he asks, to what extent are and will investor state dispute settlements brought by fossil fuel companies hamper developing countries' choices or decisions for green transitions. So this is um, this is a, a common feature of trade deals, uh, that there's a, a kind of private court where if investors feel like a government policy is um, sort of wrecking their profits, they can sue the government um, and can, can have quite a potentially quite a chilling effect 
on um, on the, those governments' uh, climate policies. So, um, Michael, what what would you um, say about that? Well, frankly, not that much more than you just said right there, um, <laughs> it, uh, Megan. I think that that this is not gotten as much attention. Uh, generally, and I want to do a shout out to Aveda's organization, um, IISD. Um, the, the problem is that the way that these treaties have been negotiated can force uh, countries to allow, can limit the ability for countries to constrain a productive activity, fossil fuel production activities and leave open uh, the potential for suits in, in our international arbitration that has not necessarily been friendly to the sovereignty of countries. And um, so there is an alternative treaty framework that Aveda's colleagues have developed that is very promising for revising these investor state arrangements. And so I encourage those who are motivated around this to to look into that, to work uh, in promoting that. And you're seeing also a number of countries just not, uh, especially developing countries, saying uh, enough of these agreements uh, in general. So I think there is, there is a, a promising trend in that direction. Um, you know, let, let me also just point out that, um, no, let me leave it at that, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, so there's there's some more awareness of it, but it, it's still um, quite an obscure uh, process to to a lot of people, I guess. Um, but um, Stuart McWilliam from the Global Gas and Oil Network has a question for Andrea. Um, what can NGOs and others do to help make the case to the IMF? to introduce the right type of conditionality to allow for green and blue investment? I think that um, it's good to come with a specific numbers and a specific instruments that um, can contribute in this discussion. I think that if different institutions, NGOs and different uh, the UN and, and different uh, spaces, even like this kind of fora, that we continue bringing good ideas, good examples, then it's, I think, easier that these other institutions can continue here and continue taking evidence and numbers and concrete examples of the kind of, of policy instruments that should be considered in, in this transition. I think that uh, when you start seeing um, what is about green recovery, there is a lot of good, right now, good papers out there. But I think that we need to continue uh, bringing those to these um, to these multilaterals um, and these development agencies. It, it's critical right now because everything is moving so fast. So I think that the more we have conversations and papers. And, and requestings, like uh, open requests from different stakeholders, I think it's, it's, it's a good way of contributing to this. Okay, and um, I, there, there are a couple more um, sort of quite technical questions that I haven't, um, I don't think we ha quite have time for. Um, so I'm just gonna, um, the last question is from Peter Newell, who asks, um, this is another one for Andrea, uh, could Costa Rica be part of a first movers coalition of countries powering past fossil fuels? And I guess he's inspired there by that. There has been a coalition uh, called the Powering Past Coal Coalition, um, which has, has gathered a bit of momentum recently. Um, could there be something more broader for, for fossil fuels? And would, would Costa Rica like to lead it? <laughs> I will say that that yes, that sounds terrific. That sounds super great. Uh, my concern is that we're really a small a small group, <laughs> a small team. But if there is a lot of people out there and and can contribute, yes, we can. We we will be honored to be leading something like that. And it is even helpful for our national discussion right now. And I think that we need to generate more pressure. This is. We really want to pass this law. This is like our first uh, milestone in, in the short term, you know, to, to do this moratorium 
a legally blinded <laughs> thing. So um, even for these, like an international campaign can really also contribute to all this. Hi, it's Adam um, here. Can I just add on, on Power and Pass Call? Because I mean, we're a member and a supporter of it. And just the, let, let's be clear, that's about electric utility switching. So, and that's the power of the demand side changing their demand. And so if we can focus on the autos, the ships, our choices, et cetera, and ensure that there's a consensus and a drive to sort of adopt zero carbon pathways there, then whoever produces coal, it doesn't matter because it, it's not going to be demand for it. And that's why these sort of focuses on changing the demand is so important. OK, um, I mean, I think um, I think we've we've had a lot of great questions there and a lot of um, really interesting, insightful comments from our panel. Um, so I'm going to wrap things up um, and say uh, thank you to all the panelists. Um, thank you to everyone who followed along and asked questions. Uh, I hope you all got something out of it. Um, I think uh, I think the panelists are all on Twitter, so if you sort of have any follow-ups, um, you know, the conversation can continue. Uh, and hope to see you all next year in London. Um, you know, assuming we're uh, allowed to leave our houses again. Um, so uh, thanks everyone, um, and I'm gonna gonna wrap things up there. Thank you.